Welcome back to another Walk in the Light devotional. My name is Elder Palmer. And my name is Elder Fellows, and we will be tonight's hosts. As we get the event started and people are tuning in, make sure to let us know down in the comments below where you are tuning in from. We hope that all of your days have gone just swimmingly, and we're glad that you have decided to end them here with us as we listen to an inspiring message from three-time Olympic gold medalist swimmer, Rowdy Gaines. Before we dive into the message, Let's get things started with an opening musical number by Ariana Fonsbeck and an opening prayer offered by Sophia Nguyen, all of whom are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints living in the Cambridge, Massachusetts area.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us opportunity to get together today with the technology, even though we're not together, but we're here in the spirit. Thank you for giving us um, so much blessing during this day and keep us safe and give us all the support we need in the moment. And I'm so grateful for our um, brother, James, sharing his um, experience and testimony. Um, I'm just asking you, God, can you please bless us to um, hear, have all of the spirit around here and send us the message I think that we need to hear things we need to know and guide us through the the day and I say the things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for that powerful prayer and touching music. As we mentioned before tonight we're joined by Olympic swimming legend Rowdy Gaines. Rowdy spent many years on top of the swimming world as a world and American record holder and two time Olympian. He won the 1980 and 1981 NCAA championship in the 100 meter freestyle and 200 meter freestyle swimming for Auburn University. He won a total of three Olympic gold medals and is a 25 time world record holder. After his Olympic career, Rowdy has competed in master swimming and continues to break records, win medals, and compete at the international level. He has been inducted into the U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame and International Swimming Hall of Fame and works with many charitable organizations including the USA Swimming Foundation and Swim Across America, benefiting research for cancer and Special Olympics. Today, he is Vice President of Aquatics for the Central Florida YMCA. As he talks to kids, mentors them, and spreads the message that championship comes not from the outside, but from the inside, he helps them understand that dreams can come true if you believe in yourself. Rowdy, the time is all yours. Thank you so much, missionaries, elders. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, this is a very humbling being here. Uh, before I go any further, I want to introduce my beautiful wife, uh, Judy, next to me, who uh, is going to say a few words in a few minutes. We we got a chance to watch uh, a lot of the testimonies, a lot of the uh, speeches before uh, before tonight, and they were just fascinating. They were just amazing. So I can't even believe I'm in that company, uh, but I really appreciate it. It's a great honor, and it's certainly humbling, as I said. In fact, we were watching Ty Detmers, who was one of my favorite football players, obviously in college when he played for BYU, and, and then on later on in the pros. So he was always one of my favorites, and to listen to his message was really inspiring in many ways. So um, I hope I can even get a tenth of what he uh, talked about, and, and hopefully I'll be able to um, – relate to you. That's the most important thing for me because I can tell you right off the bat, uh, I am far from perfect. <laughs> I, uh, I have made so many mistakes during my life and during my career in, in swimming that I can't even begin to tell you. But um, it's sort of, uh, sort of like what we try to teach our children anyway, that you try to learn from your mistakes. And that doesn't always work either. But uh, I, was, I was fortunate enough to have a, a, some amazing people around me uh, during my career, and uh, I still do with my wife, uh, Judy, as I said, and uh, we have four daughters <laughs> and three granddaughters. So yes, I play with Barbies and I like it. That's how bad it is in my house, um, just so you know. But uh, they're, they're wonderful. I, I, I can't imagine my life without them. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my swimming career. I <laughs> I have a little bit of an unusual story because I am from Florida. I'm a third generation Floridian. My father was born here. My grandfather was born here. So I, um, I'm a Floridian through and through. And even though you guys said I did go to Auburn, we now live in Orlando, Florida, and we've been here for like the last 10 or 11 years, actually 13 years. We moved in 2008. So we've been here quite a while and, um, we, we love Florida and we love, uh, being here. I grew up in Winter Haven, Florida, which is about an hour from here. It's like right in the center of the state. If you threw a dart in the center of the state, you'd hit Winter Haven. And I grew up on a lake. Winter Haven has about 120 lakes in its vicinity. And um, I grew up on a lake my whole life, uh, learned how to swim before I learned how to walk. I was nine months old when I learned how to swim because our house was literally 10 feet from the lake. My parents water skied for an attraction back then called Cypress Gardens. 
and they would literally take the boat over to Cypress Gardens, water ski in the shows all day long, and then they'd come back. My grandparents lived next door to me, and you know they would they would babysit for me. I have a younger sister, two and a half years old, or two and a half years younger than I am, and so it was a really great life growing up. I didn't start swimming competitively though until I got to high school. I was 17 years old when I went out for my high school swim team. Um, I was a junior. 11th grade, I had tried out for five other sports my sophomore and junior year, and I got cut in every single sport, football, baseball, basketball, golf, and tennis. And um, I guess the moral to that story is I never gave up because I, I love sports so much. Obviously, I just wasn't very good in them. But as a kid, I played all the different sports. We didn't have soccer back then, but <clears throat> excuse me, I played all the sports, and I, and I really sincerely loved them. Um, and I won't go into all the details behind uh, the whole swimming part of things, but I didn't get cut. I made it. And uh, and I guess the rest, they say, is history. I fell in love with it. I wasn't very good in the beginning. I didn't even know how to do a flip turn. My specialty was freestyle. There's four different strokes in swimming, freestyle, backstroke, butterfly, and breaststroke. So my specialty was freestyle, uh, but I was terrible when I first started, but the coach kind of felt sorry for me because he was also the football coach and he had already cut me once. So uh, fortunately he didn't cut me and um, I grew to really become pretty good in high school by the end of my senior year. And that's when I went to school at Auburn. Uh, you know, uh, when I went to school at Auburn, it, it was, it was a great environment for me because I literally kind of grew from a boy to a man there. I, I, I learned a lot about myself in college, as I think a lot of us that have that collegiate experience, whether it's in athletics or not, you, you learn a lot about yourself and maybe not even college. Even if you don't go to college, that time between, I don't know, 18 to 25, mm -hmm. you, you really start to discover yeah. yourself. You know, you, you don't know much. You're so immature. I was so immature. I didn't know a lot about myself. I didn't know what I really wanted, even though I loved swimming. And I kind of discovered that at Auburn. And um, I, as, as the elder said, I, 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 I had a, a great career at Auburn and uh, wonderful teammates, wonderful coaches. And then I, and then I trained for three more years. And I'll tell you why in a second for 1984. And there are a lot of words that go into becoming an Olympic champion. And, and again, I, I wasn't perfect by any stretch, but I tried to live them as, as much as I could on a daily basis. You know, words like dedication and commitment and responsibility and teamwork and, and setting goals, all those kinds of words that I felt was necessary to become su successful is, is what I did. Uh, I literally became obsessed with the sport. And back then, I would check books out in the library. I would do everything I could to find out what swimming was all about. Swimming is really not for the faint of heart. We were sitting high behind the blocks before my last race uh, at the Olympics. And I'll tell you about that in a second. But uh, the, the relay, I was swimming on a relay. And the, the four of us were talking about, you know, this eight-year journey that we had been on and, and, and what it involved. And literally in those eight years, I swam about 22,000 miles. Oh. Now, not, not, yeah, literally I swam 22,000 miles. That is the circumference of the globe at the equator, sort of, give or take a few miles. So I figuratively <laughs> swam around the world, not literally, but figuratively, that's how many miles of swimming I had put in to reach a race for me that lasted about 49 seconds. I would do it all over again because even if I had not had that experience, for me, it was all about the journey. Um, and the journey taught me so many valuable lessons. One of them primarily was in 1980, I made the Olympic team. Uh, and if you're a swimmer, the pinnacle of success for you is the Olympic Games. We don't have a Super Bowl like Ty Detmer had or a national championship like at BYU. We have the Olympics and it's every four years. In fact, as most of you know, it was delayed last summer because of the pandemic in 2020. And we hope and pray that it will be in 2021. But for me, it was completely canceled because our country decided to boycott those Olympic Games because I won't go into all the details, but they were supposed to be, have been held in the Soviet Union, back then the Soviet Union, Russia, what we now know as Russia. And the Russians had invaded another country and we felt that was wrong, so we didn't go to the Olympics. And it was devastating for us, and I say us because there were many 
And there were thousands of athletes that were going for the 1980 Olympics because that's what we had, the Olympics. Back then, that was that was it. Even in basketball back then, I mean, they didn't even have pros in in, in the Olympic Games. It was strictly college athletes. So it was it was a devastating moment, but it was also a learning moment for me. Uh, and the fact that I vowed never to give up. Um, I vowed to, to stay dedicated and committed to my goal of being an Olympian, because once you're an Olympian, you're an Olympian forever and ever. It's a great feeling because there's no such thing as a past Olympian or former Olympian. And I really wanted to have that. It wasn't so much the gold medal. Trust me, I wanted to win, but it was really about becoming an Olympian. And, uh, and that's what meant so much to me when I got to 1984. And the Olympics was was fantastic because uh, it was in Los Angeles. It was my home. It was in our home country. It's like playing. It's like the Bucks, Tampa Bay Bucks, my favorite team, Tampa Bay Bucks um, playing the Super Bowl at home. It was really a cool experience to be able to watch them play that football game in their home stadium. And that's what it was like for us. We swam in Los Angeles and. Um, and I, as, as the elder said, I won three gold medals. I won the 100 meter freestyle and I was on two relays that won gold medals. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I hesitate in, in talking about this because some of you are thinking, uh, you know, how did you start so late and become so successful so early? Uh, I, I'll give you another quick example about that. I started swimming in February this month. February of my junior year in high school, which was 1976. So 45 years ago, I started swimming. Two and a half years later, I broke my first world record. And, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, how, goodness, I mean, that was quick. How in the world did you do it so fast? And, you know, a lot of it were, were the people that surrounded me. I won three gold medals. I gave one to my mom. I gave one to my dad and one to my coach because I could not have won those. This was before I met her. Um, I could not have won those gold medals before uh, without their love and their support. We did it together as a group. I wish I could have won. My sister's mad I didn't win 40. I mean, win four. But I wish I could have won 40 because I would have given one to each one of my teammates on that Olympic team, they meant that much to me. So it was really, it was really a team effort. So many people think of swimming as, as this, this individual sport. In many ways it is, but in so many other ways, it's very much about a team. And then, and then it was, you know, a lot of it was about my coach. His name was Richard Quick and uh, it was a great name for a swim coach. And I literally could not have done what I did uh, without his love and without his coaching both in the pool and out of the pool. Uh, so certainly there were people around me that I surrounded myself that that I uh, that I believed in. It's like I, I tried in my hardest not to put the whole weight of, of the world on my shoulders. I tried to rely on others uh, as much as I tried to kind of focus on myself, too. Um, and, you know, it's it, it's perfect. You know what you guys describe these talks as walk in the light because uh, I don't need to talk about details, but you know, as a child, I went through um, something pretty tough. You know, my family is wonderful, but I, you know, it, it was pretty tough. And uh, so, so, Um, oh boy. but I do think, I do think that, um, you know, Christ was, uh, certainly guiding me along the way and, uh, You know, I just felt very fortunate, and very blessed. And uh, I certainly didn't verbalize that a lot. You know, I didn't uh, I didn't verbalize that very much at all. I still don't, <laughs> believe it or not, all these years later. But I do look back and. 
I think even though I made poor decisions in my life, I think I made, uh, I made the right decisions because, you know, I think it could have gone either way, you know, after what happened. And, uh, I think the, the Lord kind of pointed me in the right direction. And, uh, I'm very fortunate about that. You know, I'm very blessed. So, you know, it's uh, it's been this great journey for me. Um, and uh, like I said, it was really never about the M-E-T-A-L. It wasn't the metal part. I don't even know where the metal is. I think it's in our kitchen drawer. But, uh, <laughs> my mom passed away a, a couple years ago, so I got hers back. And my coach passed away about eight years ago. And so I have his back. So we have the medals in our possession, but um, but it was never really the medal, you know. It never really was. Uh, so I feel like um, I feel like I'm very blessed to be able to have this journey that I had, and you know, my wife. Uh, I asked my wife to join me because she's she's sharing a lot of this. You know, we've been married thirty. 32 years we've been together 35 years I think so it, it's been a long time we've been <laughs> together a long time so I she's been to I, I do the broadcasting now for the Olympic Games uh, I'll be in Tokyo for my eighth Olympic Games for NBC and I'm excited about that and uh, she has been to six of the seven I've been to I think the only one that she didn't go to uh, is Athens Greece right in 2004. Uh, that was post 9/11, and it was uh, it was kind of a tough time for our country. So she stayed home, and but but she's been to everyone. So I'm going to let her speak for a couple minutes because I think she's got some really cool things that she was telling me about earlier. I said you need to tell everybody. I think it's really cool about the Olympic spirit and how it relates to what we're talking about now. Okay, well thank you, um, and thanks, Tom. Really <laughs> um, and you can chime in and help yeah. with whatever, whatever you like. So who is excited for the Tokyo Olympics? I am. Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, everyone. Right. Okay. So as Rowdy was saying that um, I was able to uh, attend six Olympic games with him. And as a spectator, as um, an Olympic fan and being married to an Olympic athlete, um, I've had some very interesting experiences, um, and I just wanted to share a couple things with you. So about the Olympic torch, um, we have an Olympic torch that I wanted to share with you. So here is a, a torch from the 1984 Olympics. So what I love about the Olympic torch is that it has a flame, right? And so this, is a, this was part of a torch relay. And so it's a uh, tradition. You're not allowed to ever relight this, okay? It has to be lit from the Olympic cauldron, right? It can't ever be relit again, okay? Um, and on the torch, it says Citius Altius Fortius, which is the, the Olympic motto. And those are um, Latin words that mean faster, higher, and stronger. And then, um, so... The flame heralds the coming in of the celebration of mm -hmm. the Olympic Games. Yeah, you can hold it, and it has the actual Olympics on it. It says uh, "Games of the." Yeah, it's got the motto, or okay. it's got the thing on there. But the lighting of the torch is it conveys a message of of peace and friendship, and the ceremony itself is um, largely symbolic to connect the ancient Olympic Games to the modern Olympic Games. So, um, in my humble opinion. I, what I love about this too is that it's symbolic. The flame is symbolic to me about the fire of the human spirit that burns inside of every person, that we're all born with that fire, that light, because what happens? A fire, it shares light, right? Okay. So Roddy shared with you his story of overcoming the 1980 Olympic boycott. He had to train four more years, three more years? until the next Olympics. And he was slated to win, what, five medals at that Olympics? Mm -hmm. Five and 80. Five and 80, right. So he continued training for another four years and inspiring that he didn't give up, right? And Rowdy does not give up. He is, when he puts his mind to something, he, 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 he succeeds. There's a couple other stories that I'd like to share with you. Um, 
1992, during the Bar Barcelona Olympics, Derek Redman was um, preparing in the uh, semifinals in the 400 meter race. And as he started running, he pulled a hamstring. And he actually tore the muscle in his hamstring and he couldn't run. And he laid on the track and something inside of him, I was listening to his interview, he said, you get up and finish the race. And as he started to get up and run and finish that race, the crowd erupted and started cheering for him. And then his father came from the stands and ran out and helped him to finish the race. And in his interview, he said, I am more famous for not finishing the race than I am for finishing because it was just so incredibly inspiring what he did. Number two, or actually three, this is Wilma Rudolph, another uh, Olympic champion from the um, Rome 1960 Olympics. I actually did a book report on her when I was a little kid, um, and she inspired me. She was came from a family of 21, um, very poor family. She might um, have been LDS, I think. No. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> She, she was stricken with polio, and um, by the time she was 12, she'd overcome it, and she started to walk again. The doctors told her that she would never be able to walk, right? And, right. and then eight years later, she became an Olympic champion, right? Great story. Carrie Strug from the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. I was there. I was in the very last row in that arena. We had to use binoculars to see. But she had injured herself during the competition, and um, this was the team that was called the Magnificent Seven, and she hurt herself on the vault. And what she actually did was, I think she had broken her, um, her ankle, and when she came back out, we didn't know if she was going to compete again, right? So she comes out, and her foot is wrapped, and we're thinking, oh, my gosh, is she going to do it? Is she going to try? And Sure enough, she gets up, it's her turn, and they call her name, and she starts running, and she flies through the air, and she sticks that landing, and she wins the gold medal, and the place just was on fire and ecstatic with joy and happiness for her. She wins the gold medal. She overcame that adversity and was able to fight through the pain. Um, next, this is one of my favorite stories. This is um, Jason Lezak. And the four by one hundred freestyle relay in Beijing, China. So Rowdy was in the booth calling the race. <laughs> I was across in the stands with Team USA. There was probably about fifty of us um, sitting together. And I remember watching the race. Um, do you want to help me with the rest of it? So right, yeah, I mean, you can Google the race, and you'll 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 know kind of what we're talking about. It was, uh, it was really the greatest race in Olympic history, in my opinion, anyway. I'm a little biased because of swimming, because it was swimming, but it was really a cool thing because uh, this was a sort of a journeyman sprinter. His name was Jason Lezak, and he anchored this relay, the 400 free relay for the United States. Michael Phelps was on that relay. Yes. This was Michael's chance to go for his second of eight gold medals. So if they had not won that, then, you know, he would have most likely won seven golds and one silver and eight gold sounds a lot better. The guy that Jason was anchoring against was from France. The big, the team that beat was France and the guy that was anchoring for France, Alan Bernard, a wonderful guy, very nice guy, but he was the world record holder. He was also going to go on to win the Olympic gold medal in the Hunter freestyle a couple of days later. So uh, anyway, the long story short, Jason goes in from behind, way behind, uh, and he tracks uh, Alan Bernard and, and w ends up winning the race, by, I think, by eight one hundredths of a second. Uh, and today, 13 years later, that is still the world record for the 400 freestyle relay. And it was the fastest split in history. We, he went 46.0. And to put that in perspective, he had never broken 47 in his life. And usually you go your best time by tenths of a second. You don't go your best time by well, his best time before that on a relay was 47.4, I think, so almost a second and a half. So it was a, it was a magical moment, and uh, it was certainly a moment that uh, was great for Team USA as well. It was, and it and you can ask people who are Olympic fans or anyone who's watched the Olympics, they remember where they were, they remember that race, and it was inspiring because on paper, 
And you as an analyst and a swimmer and all the technical part of it said, there's just no way that we can win. That's the beautiful and fun and wonderful thing about the Olympics and the celebration of the human spirit. That last, what, how many meters was it? 20 meters? Mm -hmm. That Jason, something happened and he had just clicked it and he touched that wall and we all celebrated, right? Every one of us celebrated with him. We celebrate with each Olympic Olympian, whether they make the podium stand or not. Um, and in my opinion, um, the Olympic movement, again, is about overcoming obstacles, celebrating hard work, dedication and commitment and teamwork and doing your personal best. And this reminds me of the light of Christ. Um, I'm going to read something here for you. The light of Christ is just what the word implies. Enlightenment, knowledge, and an uplifting, ennobling, persevering influence that comes upon mankind because of Jesus Christ. For instance, Christ is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. This is in Doctrine and Covenants 93.2. And then in John 1.9 in the New Testament, it says... That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. We are all born with the light of Christ, every one of us. And it is a gift from our Father in heaven to each of us to have this persevering influence. We can overcome obstacles. Sometimes we may fall down. Sometimes we may not make an Olympic team, but we'll make it a few years later. Sometimes we make it to the podium. Sometimes we don't. But in the journey of life, um, we are all born with this life, with this uh, light within us. And if you could pull up the photo for us, um, I would appreciate that, our host. So I just wanted to share this photo with you. This photo is very sim symbolic to me. Um, it was in, from the 2002 Salt Lake City Olympic Games. This is um, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, Elder Neil A. Maxwell and President Gordon B. Hickley, who was the prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They are sharing the light with one another from the Olympic torch, from that flame. And just as we share our light with one another, um, we will have the ability to persevere and we will um, all rise together and be victorious as we share our light with one another, just as this symbolic photo shows. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, honey. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over here to the elders. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say one more quick thing, um, uh, you know, on that, you know, as I said, I won three gold medals. I had given them all away. I, I, I'm really not that big of a deal. You know, I try to tell kids this anyway, you know, the big deals in your life need to be the people that love you and care for you the most. And, you know, hopefully that's your family. Hopefully that's your mom and dad. You know, sometimes it has to be a grandparent or an aunt and uncle or brother and sister or uh, your teachers, your coaches, um, certainly uh, your bishop uh, and, and, and your bishopric. Uh, you're the president of the Relief Society. My <laughs> wife is president of the Relief Society now. So, uh, you know, it's it's those are the people that you really should look up. Athletes are probably people that you look at and think are really cool. Like I'm really cool. Um, but that's about it. Uh, but I, I, I agree with, with, with my wife. Um, the fact that we are all born with this gift, you know, I really believe that. I think the Lord put us on this earth for a very specific purpose. And, uh, you know, my gravestone's probably going to read rowdy Gaines dash swimmer. And I'm okay with that. I really am because the sport means so much to me. I love the sport of swimming so much. I can't even begin to tell y'all. I still swim every day, not much, but I still <laughs> swim every day, um, six days a week anyway. And uh, and I, uh, I and I owe it a lot. And uh, and I, I believe that gift is in all of us. And sometimes it takes a little while longer to discover that gift. You may be thinking, well, I'm 25 and I still don't know what I want to do in my life. Uh, yeah, it's okay. It's, it's all going to work out. You know, you have to believe in that. You have to believe that you have that gift because you do. I honestly and truly believe that. So um, um, I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ as well. Thank you.
That was 25 minutes on the nose, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I love that message. I love the, the experiences that you shared and how you were able to persevere through those hard times. And uh, I love the story that you shared, um, Sister Gaines, about Derek Redmond and how, how his dad held him up and made me think about the Savior and how he's there to support all of us through our difficulties as well. Right? You, dude, you can look that up. You can look up Derek Redman on Google. His, Derek Redman, 1992. And it, it really is inspiring. Wimmel, Wimmel Rudolph, you can look up all her races. All the they, really, they really are. The, 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 the athletes that she talked about are, and there's a million of them. <coughs> Excuse me, but those were wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was, that was a great message. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. We appreciate yeah. it. We're going to go in and get started in our question and answer portion. Okay. We'll pull up the first question from John Toronto. He asked, Rowdy, how, it is, how is it that you gain the strength to let others in, into your life and help you in your greatest desires and goals? Well, because I'm a big scaredy cat. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not strong. You know, sometimes I'm strong in, in, in certain areas and I, I like to think I am, but I have no, no problem relying on help and advice and counsel of others. And, and certainly with the Lord, I have no, believe, believe me, I turn to the Lord a lot, especially when I'm, I'm struggling with my faith. And I struggle all the time, all the time. And sometimes when I'm struggling, that's when I really try to pray and just say, you know, get me through this, please. I'm begging you. You know, I'm, I'm really struggling here. And it, it, it goes the same with the people that you surround yourself. If you surround yourself with good people, then it's OK to go to those uh, those people for life. I mean, uh, for uh, advice and counsel. Um, and, and, and first and foremost, it should be your family. It doesn't always work out that way. Right. I understand that. Um, but um, but that's who you should turn to the most, you know, obviously, except for um, our Savior, because uh, there's nothing there's really nothing better than prayer. And uh, so for me, I. Uh, we try to do that as much as possible. I don't mm -hmm. do it enough. She does it a lot more. So <laughs> she she's the president of the Relief Society. Right. right? So she's a little stop, bit stop. a little bit closer. Stop. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Question. <laughs> yeah, that's some great advice. Uh, we can all pray a little bit more. Uh, and we'll now move on to our next question. And that is from Michael Samways. It says, how can we keep our personal fire burning without becoming complacent? Oh, good question. That's a great question. I, I think for me, uh, again, I, I go back to the, from a career standpoint, um, my coach was always really, big in the belief of setting goals. Um, we were, we set goals uh, so much during um, my career. And, and a lot of them were, were short-term goals and, and some of them were long-term goals. And obviously the long-term goal is to become an Olympian, but you know, when it's 1981 and you're three years away from the Olympics, that's, that's a tough goal to stay, to keep that fire burning. Right. So for me, yeah. It was really important that I tried to really work day to day. I just, I just tried to get through each day. You know, like you're swimming ten miles a day. You, you know, there, it, it 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 gets monotonous sometimes, and so you just try to try to get through each day, and uh, and along the way you set goals. Well, you talked because I asked you. I said because I swam with Rowdy. And looking at the black line on the bottom, I said, how did you do that for three hours <laughs> in the morning and at night staring at that black line? And, and I said, did you love it every single day? He said, no, there were days that I hated it. I hated it, but he had the vision. And so sometimes you fake it till you'll make it. You go through the motion, right? Yep. So you just swam. I, I think the key word in that and especially the back to the question real quick is what she's saying is consistency. Right, consistency. You know, she's right. There were many days I didn't want to swim. There were, there were days I got kicked out of practice. <laughs> My coach would, not many, trust me, but I got kicked out of practice. Some days I'd miss and I'd pretend like I had a sore throat and I missed. But the key <laughs> word for me was always consistency. I consistently had a passion for what I did. 
And I think if people ask me all the time, what's the number one thing and number one reason why you want a gold medal? And I will tell them every single time it was because I loved what I did. I had a passion for swimming. I loved it. Not all the time, but consistently, I really loved what I did on a daily basis. Oh, that's great. That's I love that input that you guys gave on on the goals and consistency. And I think that really is so important in our lives, not just in our, our hobbies or our careers or whatever, but in just right. all parts. Right. So true. Yeah. We'll go on with our next question now from Chase Red, and he asked, with so much success, it could have been really easy to let all of that pride go to your head. How did you remain humble and give honor to the Lord for your triumphs? Also, Michael Phelps or Caleb Dressel. Well, um, I, I think uh, for me, it wasn't hard staying humble because, and first of all, I wasn't humble all the time. Sorry for laughing. I know. I mean, there were many times where I thought I was, you know, king of the castle. And and obviously I wasn't. I got shot down a lot because I lost a lot of races. And losing races will humble you. Getting beat in practice will humble you. And that happened all the time. Um, but I also realized that I shared these successes with other people. And so I, I don't want to say that it diluted it. That's a wrong word. But it really helped kind of spread the wealth, so to speak. So I kind of knew it wasn't just me. It was the, the men and the women I was swimming with in practice that were pushing me every day. It was my coach that was standing on the deck, you know, six hours a day, pushing me to try to succeed uh, as best I could. And it was just, I know this sounds really corny all, but it was really just doing the best I could. You know, all they can ever ask from you is to just do your best, you know. And for that, I really, it really helped me. But stay humble. And, and, and I know they, they wrapped up with Michael and, and, and Caleb. And of course, Michael's the greatest swimmer in history, bar none. Nobody's even close. Nobody's in his league. He's won 28 Olympic medals, 22 of them gold, I think, or 23 gold. Uh, so, I mean, he's the greatest. Uh, but Caleb Dressel is another name that you should watch for the, this summer. He's, he's a He's a great guy, um, great Christian who has uh, done so much for the sport of swimming as well. And he's got a chance to win six, seven gold medals himself. So uh, it should be a fun summer to watch him. He's but Michael has retired. Too bad. We'd like mm -hmm. them back. <laughs> yeah, the swimming world will miss, will miss him, surely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll go on to our next question now. And uh, that comes from John Nealman. It says, what is the best advice that your parents have given you to help you in your life? Well, as I said, my parents were unique in the fact that they both supported me, but very differently. You know, my dad was much more, I wouldn't say stern, but he was much more laid back about my swimming. and was much more interested in my educational success. You know, I, I call him up and say, hey, dad, I just broke this world record. It was so cool. He goes, great. How'd you do in school today? You know, so <laughs> it was it was much more on the education side. My mom was a big crybaby. Uh, listen to me talking about being a crybaby. Um, and, uh, you know, she would, you know, I'd call her and say, Mom, I had a good practice day, and she'd be in tears. So it was, they were both unique. Uh, but I think, I think what I appreciated about both of them was the fact that they, their love was unconditional. It had no bearing on how I did in the water for their love for me. And I think that meant the most to me as a son to be able to, to say to them, that's what I appreciate the most, that no matter how I do in a swim race or swim race or how I do in the classroom, you're still going to love me. And that that's all that really mattered to me. So for, for me, it was it was great to have parents like that. And my father's still alive, by the way. My, my mom's passed, but my my father's still alive. <laughs> that's great. And I think a lot of us can. And say the same about our parents that they do a lot to help us in our lives and yeah successful That's great. definitely we'll go on to our next question now from Cade K Mac and he asked I'm not sure if the gospel had entered into your life yet but if so how did the gospel guide you during your Olympic career oh. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the gospel had not entered my life. I uh, was baptized in 
1998. Well, you were born and raised. I was born and raised a Christian. Yeah, we went to Lutheran church. Uh, when I, I went to a Lutheran school, I went to a private school, Grace Lutheran in Winter Haven, Florida. I went to school uh, during my uh, elementary school years. And uh, uh, we, you know, we grew up going to church every weekend. I did not become a member of our church, the Latter-day Saint Church, um, until much later. Actually, it was through my wife and uh, who had, uh, well, I'll let her tell quickly, but she, she uh, um was baptized in the church in high school and had gone, well, you tell them quickly. Right. Yeah, she had gone inactive for a few years and then we had moved to Hawaii. We lived in Hawaii for eight years and, uh, or nine years, eight or nine years. And, um, and there we met a, another couple who invited us to church and happened to be in a Latter-day Saint church. And uh, so she immediately started going back to church and reactivated and, and became involved. And I spit and, shoot out enough missionaries like yourself <laughs> the next 10 years to supply an army. Dude, you, you guys came and went like that, man. Let me tell you, it was not easy to dump y'all. You'd start teaching me the gospel. And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. What about this? <laughs> and that was the end of y'all. No, no, no. That, that I, I appreciated every single missionary that went through my home and it was awesome. But I like this question because the question was, how has, did the gospel affect your life during your Olympic career? I feel like just from some of the stories in answer to your question that Rowdy has told me about his coach, Richard, in particular, um, it's my opinion personally that um, Richard was sent to Rowdy by Heavenly Father to help him on this Olympic journey. Um, Richard and he had this connection that was, um, he was like a Probably. father figure to Rowdy and he um it, it, it was just divine. There was there was a special relationship between them, and he believed in Rowdy and didn't let him doubt himself. He was just he was inspired to be in your life. I really feel like he was. He was. You're right. Right. So yeah, that's the answer to that question. <laughs> that's a great conversion story, and and going back to what you said about you know. Going through so many elders, I mean, consistently. Oh, right? oh, you have no idea how many he chewed up and spit out when we lived in Hawaii. And then um, it wasn't until seven years later when our daughter Madison was getting baptized. I don't know how much time we have, but um, not much. Not much. Okay. Well, our, at our daughter's baptism, he was asked to speak and he gave the talk on the Holy Ghost. And um, during that talk, the Holy Spirit was manifesting to him that. What he was saying, he was saying, Madison, I can give you a lot of things, but the one gift that I cannot give you is the gift of the Holy Ghost. That has to come from our Father in Heaven. And then as he spoke those words, he couldn't speak because the Spirit was telling him the same truth. And so that's when he decided to become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that he knew that it was true. And that um the lord was speaking to him so it was it was powerful and he got baptized and we got sealed in the temple for time and all eternity with our children and um it's been wonderful and it's been challenging and it's hard and it's been great and all of those things it's like the journey of the olympics sometimes you fall sometimes you get back up like i was inactive for 10 years and um, came back through someone who passed their torch to me and shared their light with me. And that was um, some very dear friends of ours from Hawaii who helped bring me back. And um, so I'm grateful to them, Jeanette and Kirk Anderson. So um, now you're making me cry. Okay. <laughs> <But> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So I'm thankful for that experience. Yeah, we're grateful for you guys for sharing that with us. We'll, we'll bring up that next question now. Um, and it's from Kaysen Holbrook. It says, many people might say that the gold medals have been your greatest accomplishments, but what has truly been the greatest accomplishment in your life? Oh my gosh, these questions are so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so good. Uh, uh, well, certainly, you know, 
without meaning to sound too mushy and corny, I, I think, you know, for me, I, I love my family, you know, my family, uh, I, 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 my, my wife and my four daughters and my three grandchildren, uh, I, I, I think for me, they're, they're the ones that mean the most to me. And, and I, I, I don't like to use the word accomplishment, but uh, certainly the, the word of love uh, jumps out because uh, I have unconditional love for them too. And uh, I think, uh, you know, for those people out there that are grandparents, it's, uh, <laughs> it's an incredible experience. If I knew that uh, what a grandparent would be like, I would have had them first for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, because being a grandparent is, is just so awesome. And uh, we've got very, very sweet grandchildren and uh, don't get to see them enough, but we love them very much. And uh, so for me, outside of the, you know, the actual Olympics, it, was, it would certainly be um, what's meant so much to me is my family. I shouldn't say outside the Olympics, but uh, they're, they're like apples and oranges, obviously. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. And we'll go on to our last question here. And it'll be from Anderson da Silva Leguizman. He asked, Rowdy Gaines, who has been the most Christ-like person in your life and how have they shaped you? Well, believe it or not, it's 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 this fool right here next to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> she uh, she is really, oh my gosh, I wish you guys knew what what a shining example she is to so many people. Uh, she is, she does so many things uh, that are so good, uh, not only for our children and trying to point them in the right direction as I spoil them rotten, um, <laughs> but uh, but also helping others. You know, she's always putting others before herself. And it's really, it's humbling to see that because um, I like it to be all about me. And uh <laughs> And uh, she, no, no, no. And she's, <laughs> no, she, obviously she helps me tremendously, but uh, I, I mean, if, if I'm picking one person, it's, it's gotta be, it's gotta be Jude because she's, uh, she's been that great Christ-like person to me anyway, for, for many, many years, um, 35 years. And um, so, and, and, and as Judy said, my coach before I met was certainly Christ-like and, and um, somebody that was, uh, you know, I had a real connection with. I think when you spend so much time with somebody and they're trying to create these goals for you, it's, you know, you've got to have trust. And uh, I certainly trusted my coach implicitly. I mean, I literally could not, guys, in my 100 meter freestyle at the Olympics, I should have been fifth or sixth. I, I was not the best swimmer that day in 1984. Could have swum that race 10 times and I would have lost nine of them. Um, but for one reason or another, that one magical race was, uh, was mine to have. And, uh, and, and I give 90% of the credit to, to my coach, Richard Quick, because, uh, he, he did some things that, that I won't go into details with, but he did some things with me technically before the race that, that changed dramatically how I swam the race. And because of that, I won, I won the gold medal. If he had not changed that, uh, I wouldn't have won. So uh, certainly he, he was a big influence in my life. Right. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for these experiences and thoughts that you've shared with us tonight. Unfortunately, this was all the time that we had for the, the question and answer portion. Yeah, so now we'll, we'll close it out now with a musical number from Deborah Palmer, accompanied by Ariana Fonsbeck, and then we'll have a prayer given by Parabin Hada. And then we'll bring you guys back on to share any closing remarks that you'd like to share.
Your kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for uh, for the opportunity that we had today to hear from Brother Gain and his testimony. And uh, uh, we, we're grateful for uh, the work and the, the effort that he has put in. We're grateful for uh, the missionary work and all the things that they, uh, they had done. And uh, we are grateful for the gospel in our life. And this thing we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much, brother and sister Gaines, for, for joining us tonight. It has been a pleasure to have you guys. Thank um, you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you, guys. I, I just very quickly, I wanted to thank uh, thank all the missionaries, uh, Elder Palmer, especially you, because you and I have been emailing back and forth for, your, like, for the last month or so, it <laughs> seems like. And you've been very, very good at making sure everything is organized and everything was a go. So, And all the guys behind the scenes, I know we were talking to – some of the missionaries behind the scenes and, and others. It was really, you guys do a great job with this. This is really, really, uh, it was a great experience for us. And uh, I, I, finally, I want to thank the, the Sivers family because uh, Brother um, uh, Mark and, and Carmen Sivers um, were uh, were really great uh, people to us. And now they, they live up in your neck of the woods, and I think they kind of connected us somehow or another. So um, we want to thank them and tell them we miss them and and uh, hurry back to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And, and again, thank you so much for being on. Your your message was very inspiring. And um, as always, if there's anyone that had any questions that did not get answered tonight, um, just feel free to message the page and we'll uh, try our best to answer your questions and, and to give you more information. And also make sure to tune in next Saturday again at the same time for the next uh, Walk in the Light devotional. Thank you guys so much. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. See ya.